All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Nick Slavic. I am the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company, also the host of this show, Ask a Painter Live. It is a weekly live Facebook show where I use my over two decades, almost three decades of experience in this trade now as either a craftsperson or a business owner to answer any questions. And we are not gonna waste any time today. We have one of my favorite people, frequent guest of the show, Adam Weinzettel on of JMJ Painters. Uh, we're going to pop him on the screen uh, right away here, and then I'm going to go through a short intro. And as always, he comes more prepared than any person we ever have on the show. We're going to let Adam uh, then start leading the discussion here. So Adam will be popping on. Adam, thanks for joining me today. It's a gift to be here always. Oh, man, you're always kind. So, okay, everybody, uh, before we get into it, um, we are going to mention the PCA, the Painting Contractors Association. Uh, Adam and I are fans. Actually, we were just discussing the Residential Forum, which is a group of usually somewhere between 50 to 100 business owners. Uh, we gather once a year to go deep into business and theory and practices and, and professionalization and all that stuff. And of course, as it would happen, I scheduled my family vacation and then the residential forum scheduled the forum. Uh, I will not be there. Adam will be there. Yes. I'll be there. Um, people we know and love like Jason Paris and all of his guys will be there and very familiar faces from the painter internet and uh, the PCA will be there. It's a super interesting group of people and it is in San Antonio. It's in August. Uh, you guys can reach out to me. You can look up the PCA residential forum. I believe they call it Advanced Shop Talk, A-S-T. And you're, they're going to find a website and registration info. And yes, it is in San Antonio. You will likely have to fly. You will likely have to find a car. You will likely have to find a hotel room. And then you're going to have to pay for the registration of the event. But I have been to many of these things and I still have my notebook full of notes. I wonder if it's close by. I still have my notebook full of notes from these things and I reference them all the time when I look at my business. And it's really funny. I was talking with somebody about this the other day. I have my notebook from the first time I ever went to a PCA event. And at that time, I couldn't write fast enough. The notebooks were filling up and I thought, this is so overwhelming. I couldn't possibly ever do this in a lifetime. Turns out, progressively, I look back and it's like, oh yeah, I did that years ago. Just naturally with the progression, you will start checking these things off if you're intentional. So again, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Estimator Andy will be there. Adam's going to be there and a lot of other bright minds are going to be there. I would urge you to look into it. It's a great time. So, all right. Uh, other PCA events coming up. I just flew in last night uh, from San Francisco, had a master's class in San Rafael and uh, boy, a whole bunch of awesome people uh, were there. I got to tour some of uh, Dan Ross's projects. Dan Ross is somebody that uh, uh, introduced himself to me early on in the industry. And he is he is the guard. He is the veteran of the industry. And he does, if you think you do A painting work, A level painting work, uh, once you see Dan's, you will re you will rethink about everything you've ever done. Like I consider myself, depending on how you term it, a craftsman, a master craftsman, somebody who's capable of really good work. Uh, I am embarrassed about everything I've ever done when you see Dan and his company and what they do. So I get to I got to tour a very beautiful restaurant down in San Francisco where he did two gloss ceilings. And because they're in San Francisco, they could only do water-based stuff, which is a very much higher degree of difficulty than, than oil stuff and uh, flawless and, and super impressive. So, all right, everybody, we are not going to uh, belabor this anymore. Uh, Adam Weinzettel, what do people need to know about you? You own a company called JMJ Painters, yes? Yep. We uh, So we're based up in here in Minnesota, not too far from Nick, actually. Ironically enough, I grew up in San Antonio, so it's my first oh. PCA event and I'm going home, which is kind of oh. funny, but uh, I couldn't believe that. I was like, really? All right, let's do it. So That's I awesome. did see the Alamo again and you know, hang out on the river. So I'm, I'm really excited. Honestly, I'm excited for Mexican food and queso, real queso. Yes. That's what I'm talking about. So you can't ask people in Minnesota for queso or brisket. It's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, so that's exciting. So our company is about in our third season. So we're, we're a little toddler company now. Um, but we're, we, um, decent size at this point. We've got about six, seven crews on any given week right now. So we're, we're getting up there in size and trying to catch up to some of these guys. And, um, but first things first, um, my, I, I say we a lot, my wife is, um, partner in the business and she's involved in everything that we do. We've got two little girls who are, we just had our second a month and a half ago. So she's, She's a joy. Um, so the family's growing and 
Um, we're loving every bit of it. And is he and selling? Our, oh yeah, yeah. It's a it, well. Once we found out she was pregnant, I was counting the months, and I'm like, dude. Right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so, so, uh, so it worked out, man. Um, we've got a couple people on our team now, so we've we've built up a. We got one and a half uh, team members right now, one full time, one part time, which has been really good in the office to help out. And then we're a Christian company too. So for us, everything we do, um, we're here to glorify God in all that we do. And uh, no matter what background people are coming from, we're just trying to bring that bit of joy and that positivity and the um, the light to the world, right? And try to try to leave everybody better than we found them. Um, that's the goal. So that's what we're here to do in business. And um, I mean, I think as people realize it actually is better for business to be good to people right um <laughs> internal and external which is kind of crazy we have to come to that realization but it, it's sad it's sad that that is a competitive advantage and a strategy yeah. right yeah. like you know that it, i guess you know when when i started my business 14 years ago it was just like i it was interesting that i've been doing this decent human being theory for so long it was so evident to me i did not even see it another way. Like I had never gone down the path of, well, we'll just get a whole bunch of painters. And I just looked around in the contracting world and didn't see what I like. So we kind of have to do it ourselves, right? We have to make our own sort of company culture and things. And, and it, yeah, pretty soon it dawned on me that people were like, oh, that's an interesting approach. That's a new way of recruiting. It's like, doesn't everybody just do it? Doesn't everybody just kind of be people centric and want to gather up good people? I don't know, man. It's a, so yeah, that, but it's, it's a statement about our industry though, which is, not full of bad people, but just needs to do some thinking about how we do things. We can all be better. Mm -hmm. Well, and I don't know if you, I mean, I don't know if you know the numbers better than I do as far as if there is, if there's a, now an exodus into the trades, like I feel like there is, you know, like people are realizing this is actually a decent alternative. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm talking to my friends as they're, you know, coming, coming into the workforce and I'm just saying like, guys, Look at it, you know, it's an opportunity. It's a great, great opportunity. And also all the trades, you know, but um, being well, in a I, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting right now because I think there's going to be, uh, I think we will not be able to look for some piece of data that we can grab onto. I think it's happening now, but I think there's a lag in how it's reported and how we feel it. Uh, uh, what, what I do know is that a decade from now, we'll look back and we'll say, that's like the bottom of the hockey stick curve, one of those things. So the stats all from the last five to 10 years have been only 3% of millennials even consider the trades. And then when you ask millennials how they pick a job or a career, universally they say one of their most important things is, are my friends also doing it? So you can see how there's this like evil chicken and egg scenario where it's like, there's no millennials in the trade. So then the millennials aren't interested and then they're not, in the, you know, so it's, it's one of those. And yeah, so I think, well, that you combine it with, you know, what they're calling the silver tsunami, which is, you know, I think 18% of the trades is made up of boomers and they're all basically going to be gone in the next five to 10 years. So, yeah. I mean, economic supply and demand, you would say, well, if there's not enough of us, our demand goes up and then we can raise our prices, but there's still there's still a price sensitivity where you can't just triple all your prices because of the demand. People will find another alternative, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's one of my questions. We'll do. Maybe we'll just go into Ooh. that now. So I've got this yes. um, perceived value. I want to dig into perceived value because that's something that I struggle with a lot. Because um, I think we'll talk about the labor shortage. I think also because I've got a couple of things yeah. I want to dig into there, but. Um, as we are, as labor is more expensive and paint is more expensive and we are more expensive and as our businesses professionalize and we can justifiably charge a higher price, mm -hmm. you get into the perceived value question, which for those who don't know is um, people don't just buy what you're actually providing. The market rewards you for the perceived value of your service, which can be anything from actually putting the paint on the house to a great customer experience or having an app. If you have an app for your company, that's probably a competitive advantage for some of the market and they're willing to pay for that, even though it doesn't actually cost you anything more aside from the initial cost of creating the app. So what I'm curious about is where does perceived value become uh, unethical? At what point are we just expanding perceived value because we can? Um, yeah, or do you have to sort of be able to justify internally, okay, we're doing a price increase 
and here is the value we're bringing and here's why. Um, it's one thing if you're catching up. So we're, we're sort of catching up with our pricing as to where we should be in the market based yeah. on our services. Yeah. But then beyond that, if we want to start charging a premium rate, there's got to be a reason, right? Or is perceived value enough? So what's, what's interesting is the final arbiter of that for me is does a client say yes? Because that's always that's a that's a you can't force somebody to do that, right? Like you can force your a change in pricing. You can force what you do to to drive real value and perceived value. Um, but the final arbiter for me is SR. I mean, success ratio. How many say yes? How many say no? And that's a that's a market indicator for me. Now, it's interesting. I I struggle with that sort of thing because yesterday, or sorry, Thursday, when I was in San Rafael, we did the estimating master's class, and we do we talk heavily about market rate because a lot of people say, you know, what's your charge rate? What's your production rates and things like that? And there's a lot of times where I say none of that matters because there's not enough of us. <laughs> it's July especially in Minnesota and people want stuff done. So honestly, if most painters, if you doubled your rates, you would still be overwhelmed with work. Now, the problem is when I built this house that I'm standing in right now, I got a estimate for framing for about $7,800, give or take. Uh, Framer backed out on me uh, less than a month before. I mean, the house was dug foundation up and he backed out. And as you know, in Minnesota, we only have two opportunities to do this. And all the framers are busy in the spring and then in the fall. Well, it was the fall and I had a hard time finding a framer. The next least expensive framer I found was more than double that price. So you could say like predatory pricing, right? Or you could say supply and demand. And in the end of it, I was getting estimates Instead of 7,000, which I wanted, I was getting estimates for 16,000, but I was also getting estimates for 40,000 mm -hmm. to do, which is basically like a week of work for about four guys, you know? So you could say like, yes, predatory pricing, but also there were, there were guys in there who doubled their prices and not happy, right? Like I don't want to pay twice, but these guys were awesome. They did a great job and I refer them to other people right now. I love those framers. So you can you can try to act predatory pricing, but somebody's always going to be priced right. So for me, that's like a self-regulating system. How do you think about it, Adam? Yeah, I I struggle because and you know we've been we did a we did an interior. Um, it was kind of a virtual estimate. They were they were it was actually I was in the hospital. We were about to go into labor, and I'm like typing up this email I'm like, okay. I looked at the pictures. And I'm like, this is going to be fourteen thousand. Like. Yeah. I'm never going to hear from them again, right? Yeah. And then a couple of days later, they're like, yep, we're ready to get started. I'm like, okay, let's do it. Um, it was a great project, a lot of fun. We we're doing some interior walls, trim, and cabinets. And um, and it was probably under a little bit, but not too far from where, where I thought we should have landed. Um, but then I, I went there because I was kind of like, I've never even met me. And I'm like, that's a decent price point to have not even had a phone call, right? Yeah. Um, and And I'm talking to the the husband and he's like yeah you know we got a quote to do to do it all for 40 grand and that didn't even include you know this section and i'm thinking geez i could have i could have done 24 and you would have been ecstatic exactly and I, but but i feel so i guess there's two aspects there is one just because i can doesn't mean that i should mm -hmm. um we sh we could have in increased a little bit to hit our margins but above our margin goals and where we where a healthy growth oriented company should be as far as profit margin goes and paying your people well. Um, I guess I just feel like above that, people will say yes. Yeah. But does that mean that it's, um, I guess, I guess, does that create an imbalance in the economy? And I'm not an economics guy. We need to talk to Jason about this, I guess. But um, what does that do to the general economy? What would that look like if everybody started to do that? And maybe they do. You know, maybe it's just it feels different because we're in a service trade. Yep. Um, and we're and we're paying for man hours, which is yep. very different than a widget or a uh, unit, or whatever. I so this is this is always sort of squishy stuff because I would argue that you don't know if you're predatory pricing or if you're pricing above what is standard because you don't know the needs of the client. You know, mm -hmm. I mean that they. They may need something 
to solve a problem and you don't know how severe that problem is. You know, so for me, it's always been, I've always relied on people saying yes or no. I assume that they are rational, informed consumers because I do, I do, I do always fall back to one of the most basic economic principles that I learned in college, which I think about every day, which is a dollar that you make and you spend is the most efficient dollar spent. If Adam makes a dollar and I get in charge of spending it, it will not be as efficient. So I assume, Adam, that if somebody makes a dollar and spends it, they're going to try to do something efficiently. Now, we know that's not true all the time, right? There's there's people who can be talked into things and other things. But I think if you even think about this problem, you're probably not the problem. Right? <laughs> that's, that's sort of what's kind of bouncing around in my head right now. So, yeah, yeah. so what we don't do and, and you know, so... I get out there and I say one thing and I do another, which is I use that example of framing as, you know, when people say, hey, it's uh, May in Minnesota. I mean, arguably the craziest month of the entire year for us. Our phones ring to a point where we're like, we want to throw our phone away. The argument would be you should forex your deck staining price in May because everybody's already booked in May. We're already carrying over work from the last year. And if you can, if you can have the supply to quench the demand in May in Minnesota to stay in a deck, you should arguably charge whatever you want. Now, we don't do that though. I keep my pricing steady because I want the clean data. So that's it's like, I make an argument for that sort of thing, but honestly, we don't do it. We know what our pricing is. We want to be standard across the board because again, I, I know that we're assuming like if somebody calls in May for a, a deck staining project, you're like, well, I should 4X my price. You don't know that they want it in May. And you don't know what they're going to do it in May. So for me, it's like trying to guess that you would be, you might as well get, be a stockbroker then. If you can, if, <laughs> if you can figure out the irrationality of people's buying, I would not waste that on house painting prices. I would waste that on the stock market. <laughs> yeah. When do you, so when do you talk about your price increases? Is that a winter project that you do? Is there like a time where you, or quarterly you say, okay, where are we at? Where are our rates? Can we make this adjustment? Weekly weekly okay. and and our pricing so there's there's things that are ultra stable so we we get a job costing report every week every job that gets finished we get the complete job costing report and we actually go over it as a leadership team every week and there's things that we've been doing good for a long time like all our interior stuff hard data where it's down to unit pricing and we can sense you know if we're getting a whole bunch of whole house trim repaints uh trim cabinet wall repaints we can start discussing the price but if we're still doing them profitable, profitable, I'm not necessarily going to double my prices. I'm saying, okay, I feel like we can get enough of these to keep our company busy. They're profitable. Let's think about it a little bit. Now, on the other hand, we started drywall and carpentry last year. When we went out and started doing drywall, we, I thought we were doing what would be an industry standard price. We fire sold everything. Every job was like, heck yeah, when can you start? And I was like, oh, okay. All right. So I waited till the job costing came back. The job costing wasn't as great as I wanted it to be. So then immediately, week by week, we actually started moving our prices. So yeah. two examples of that for you. How about how about you? How do you how, how do you think about price? Is, is it is it fluid like that or do you kind of plan it out or how does it work for you? Yeah, so it's um, I, so I we use subcontractors. So that's that's a really um, interesting conundrum. And for me, not coming from the trade and our job costing being basically job by job, right? And not being as detailed as it will be or needs to be eventually. I mean, hourly tracking is tough with subs. There's There are ways to do it, and but we don't have the bandwidth as a company to really dig deep into that yet. And it's not the lowest hanging fruit, frankly, for our success. Exactly. Um, so for us, a lot of it is is market rate of what the subs are looking for. And that is that's been a really tricky thing especially this year and it's not just us I and mean, i've talked to several people who are like we've had guys for years and years who have never asked us for more money and now they're like hey we can get it somewhere else so are you gonna what are you gonna do yeah. um so for, so that's part of it um and and i think a, a lot of this conversation comes as far as just like my mentality of i feel like it's expensive Yes. Which is, as a salesperson, it's really hard when you feel like what you're selling is expensive because you're going to project that onto the client who may not think it's expensive. This may be a very small purchase for them. Um, mm -hmm. Or they just know because they've done it three or four times in their lifetime and they don't want to do it. 
and they see a value in it and they want to pay. There are people who, who automatically pick the highest bid because that's my philosophy. I just pick the highest bid. But yeah. so, so for us, we're, I'm looking at it constantly, basically job by job. Mm -hmm. And especially when it's somewhat fluid right now, looking at, okay, I think I, I know what our guys need. Um, and, and more than just want, right? They're not necessarily just pushing it either because their guys are, are expensive too to yeah. keep their guys on, right? I mean, if your entry guy is getting 20 bucks an hour, I mean, that's going to, that balloons really yep. quickly. And they've got their, they've got insurance and they've got all the stuff on those guys. It's, it's not cheap. So they're not making it up. Um, some of them, sometimes they're making it up. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm looking at that a lot and sort of job by job is, uh, I try to think about it in terms of days. So yeah. it's like, can our, if, if our, if our guys can get X amount per day, Mm -hmm. I know they'll be taken care of. Their guys are going to get paid well, and they'll have a profit. Theoretically, um, yeah. Yep. Right, right. And unless they're unless they're taking too long, in which yeah. is not our responsibility. It's our responsibility of the client to help them keep going and to yeah. help them be efficient. I mean, and we try to make things such that our guys are more efficient, which is how they'll be able to do more volume, which is where we will make um, make up for higher labor costs in, yep. in doing more volume. So that's kind of the theory. Um, but yeah, so so I sort of have a, a daily rate, a daily charge rate almost of like this house should take two and a half days roughly. And that gets me about where we should land. So when I'm doing the estimate, if we're off on that, then I can go through and say, okay, why is this heavy, heavy on the window trim? Mm -hmm. Right. Or this is actually a really tall house, you know, we really this is gonna take a bit longer. Um, and we're we're specializing next year repaints too. So nice. that's been that's been a big um focus even just the past couple of weeks is narrowing in and doubling down on that niche and just saying, you know, we're going to, we're going to just nail this and get really good at this um, before we, before we step back into those other areas where we have a little bit of experience. Um, so that's, that that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. So it's interesting <laughs> when you deal with subcontractors, you have, it's it's a crazy data plus feelings sort of place. Your numbers have to be dialed in because you're already dealing with one irrational consumer, the client, right? Like a lot of times they, number one, don't know what it is. They never want to pay as much as most people estimate. I mean, there's no home project that I've ever heard of that's like, I can't believe how cheap that was. Are you kidding? You know, that's never occurred. So already you're kind of in that region of that. Because prices for cars are listed everywhere, I don't think people have this crazy sticker shock. Like nobody goes to look at a brand new Ford Super Duty and be like, I had no idea, you know? <laughs> also, when you when you sprinkle in subcontracting, you and I know that a large portion of our industry is unprofessionalized, that people that don't know their numbers. So you enter into this weird region where when a client says yes, and then a subcontractor says no, is it the is it priced right? is it not priced right? You're dealing with arguably a very irrational person that they may have said no. And we always think, oh, maybe I didn't price it right. It may have nothing to do with price. They may not have availability. They may not like that type of work. And a lot of times they can't communicate it to you. So you can get thrown for this crazy carnival loop where it's like some consumers say yes and no, some sub subcontractors say yes and no, and you can make crazy price changes uh, in your business based on that. And that's why it's so good to have like, just like, okay, we know this data, follow it, respect it. And then let the, let the people interact with how they want with it. But you have to be sound with your data. Well, and the interesting thing there too, right? Data plus feelings is, um, I think people maybe have a misperception with subcontractors that we're just abdicating the work. And it's mm -hmm. like, this is a very, very close partnership and relationship. It has to be for it to work. You can abdicate the work if your guys are skilled enough and if you pay them well enough. Um, and if that's a business you want to build, it's not a business we want to build. We want to kind of hold the hand of our client throughout the project and our subs. I mean, we want to be intimately involved in their business um, to the point where we know these guys. Um, and sometimes we bid it wrong. I mean, last last yeah. week, we, I mean, there was a beautiful house here in Chanhassen that was a lot of trim. I mean, all trim, basically. And, and I kind of, I bid it out and I thought, Maybe a little bit low. Um, and then our sub is like, there's no way that he's like, I just did this. Like, I just did one like this two weeks ago. And this is going to end like, All right, just just do it. And I'll take care of you. It's going to be fine. You know, and so throughout the project, he's kind of like, 
I don't know if this is, I'm getting nervous. This is, it's taking yeah. so long. I'm like, it's okay. It's okay. Just, just do the house. Like, just do a good job. Focus on the house. It's okay. Give me good data. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so then he finishes and we make zero dollars, which is fine because yep. now, because he did a great job, client's happy. Um, he got taken care of. And now we know that, okay, we actually can't do that job for seven grand. We can do it for like 12, <laughs> you know, um, yep. and that's okay. And she would never have paid that. Which is fine because she got another bid for seven grand, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's uh, so the relationship is really key, and when you start to get to know these guys, mm -hmm. you start to realize: is it availability? Is it the type of work? Yeah. Um, we have a guy who he actually might be watching this. Actually, Carlos, who he came down and visited with you. Um, nice. Uh, yeah, yeah, he came and checked out the uh, the shop, and but uh, Carlos, Carlos is like a high end. He's great. I mean, his quality is phenomenal. And awesome, you know, you're awesome. Yeah. yeah, and we kind of got him at the beginning of his starting his company. And I just, after doing one job, I'm like, he's not going to need us for very long because <laughs> <laughs> he's great. And so we use him from time to time now. But he's sort of really making a, uh, a name for himself too, which is yeah. awesome. Which is great to see, also. So like, that's another thing. Just agreed. And that's for employees and subs. Like, are they going to outgrow me? It's like, hopefully, you know, yep. some of them will, yep. and that's great. But Carlos does not want to be on like, hey, we just moved in. Can you just quick turn the walls? That is not his jam. And he's like, yeah. oh, man, I don't like these jobs. Like, I want to do something that's, you know, beautiful. So you don't put him on it. Yeah. Um, so, the, so the relationship is really key there. Um, and then one more example for it is we had a we have a job we're starting in the next week or two. And I was asking a couple of our guys about it because I wasn't sure exactly where it would land. Um, and they... There was like a seventeen hundred dollar difference between what I was presenting to the subs. Yeah, and that's just a labor payment, and for me, that's very critical to be like, we got to get the right sub on this because I mm -hmm. thought I might have been low, but one guy super happy with it, the other one super happy with it. So then, all right, we all right, let's let's move things around now so that this works because this is a good price, and I thought it was, and I think it is. Yeah. And again, if he gets into trouble, we'll take care of him. But exactly, yeah, you know, you, you don't let your guys flounder. It's relationship, um, yeah, absolutely. Well, and and you you have to follow through on that. Yeah, um, are you guys are, are you still dabbling in subs a little bit, or is that? Yeah, it's actually been you know we we started um, we started late winter, and it's been a great thing for us, and and that was really spurred on by you coming down here and talking with us about it. And, uh, and, and, uh, as you know, I mean, theoretically the data and the processes, it's like it all, it's just a clinical thing. It makes sense. But to see how you talked about it and the look on your face when you said certain things really informed our entire leadership team about what's important and what's not. And, uh, we still, we still talk about it once in a while too. So as you, you, as an example of that, so no, it's been great this year for business. Yeah. Good. Is it, are you guys handling materials or are you, uh, are you having them buy materials? Yeah, honestly, you know, we we entered into it not knowing a few things because again, it's what guys want to do. As you know, there's a lot of variability in the in the sub trades. Some of them are fully managed, insanely capable other businesses like us. Some of them need a little more hand holding. Some of them prefer to do things, not to do things. And honestly, what we found is we control materials. Um, they, it's just something that they, we can just take off their hands. Uh, the subs that we interact with honestly don't really care about it all that much. We offered every subcontractor that we sort of vetted and interviewed. We say, here's two options for you. The one where we get all the stuff and make sure it's on site for you or the one where you do it. And everybody's like, no, 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 you do the materials. And we're like, fine, we're really good at that. We're happy to do it. How about you, Adam? We do. Well, you know, we, um, we don't pick up and deliver any of that. Our store will deliver for us, like even a yeah. gallon. And I don't know why. I'm, I don't know. I'm like, guys, why do you go to the paint store? I'm like, call our store. They will deliver it's anywhere a gallon. Up. And they're like, come on, it's just, just do it. So I don't, I don't know. Anyway, um, but we, we were doing, we were having the subs um, use our pricing and use our account, charge our account, and then uh, have them pick up all the materials and do all that. Um, I thought that it was impacting our pricing because I thought that they were looking at that as, uh, I thought they were looking at a smaller payment amount, not realizing, hey, materials aren't a part of that. Um, so it feels smaller. So they're mm -hmm. like, maybe we need to push the dollar amount up. In reality, our pricing is a little low, lower than where we should have been. 
Yeah. So we flipped that and said, okay, we're going to pay you just a set price. You're going to you're going to pick up and buy the materials. You can yep. use our pricing, but not our account. Mm -hmm. And that created unbelievable headaches as far as yes. every time we're negotiating the project, it's like, well, I'm going to have fifteen hundred dollars of materials. I'm like, this is going to be seven hundred dollars of materials. This is there's no way. Yep. So I just um, after a couple of weeks, I just said, we just got to we got to stop this. And we just started. Um, it makes it very, very clear what you're discussing as far as pricing when it's labor. Yeah. You can look at it and they can say, yeah, this will take three days. Mm -hmm. This is good. Um, yeah. And they don't have to worry about the material pricing. And I think also, you know, there are things at the end of a job. We don't want the guys extending that last can of paint as far as you can because I just really don't want to go buy another gallon and spend another yeah. 40 bucks. And that's just, uh, we don't want that. I'd rather you go Here's, buy it. Painters are super rational about paint and they should. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that I've walked through this math problem with my team because one of the things that, uh, you know, my production team is incentivized on is, you know, the, the, the material budget for the year. It's a goal for them. And the theory was I, I walked through it and, and you know, we were, we were getting it so razor's edge ordering. I told them like, all right, number one, like you said, the paint store will even curry something within an hour for $43. Uh, yes, it's a lot, right? When you pay 32 for a gallon of duration and then it costs 41, but still, what's the opportunity cost of that? What does it, yeah. it cost for a human to do that? The math problem I went through is if we left somewhere between three and five gallons of premium paint on every job, we would still be ahead at the end of the year just because it's like, yes, you don't want that waste, but the human power it's taking to do that last final paint run on 500 jobs a year. Right. Right. It, 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 it is better to just have some extra paint. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The time aspect of it. Of, of going to the paint store. Just, and you guys, it's really, I mean, as far as you go being really dialed into the materials, it makes all the sense in the world to just get it delivered. Right. I don't necessarily, I mean, I can pretty much say like, we're, we're going to be at about 20 gallons of paint. Right. Yep. Give or take, you know, and take so is it that. give or is it take? <laughs> so, <laughs> kind of a, um, so that's where it, it's kind of it's a little tricky. We haven't perfected it yet, but we have we have a really good rep at Sherwin. We use Sherwin Williams. I mean, that was my rationale for using Sherwin Williams above Hershfield's Benjamin Moore was they're everywhere. We're doing jobs everywhere. It makes sense to have a paint store near us as much as humanly possible. So it's a uh, that was my very scientific way of choosing Sherman Williams at the beginning. But. Listen, there's cons <laughs> all of it. And uh, like you said before too, even relationship with your vendors is a big thing. Cause you know, there's, there's times where I will pick a vendor for a certain thing. They may be more, it may be a little more inconvenient, but if the relationship is there, there's other ways you benefit from that as well. Logistics and, and things like that. So yeah, it's, it's a very interesting sort of interplay with all that stuff. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> what else you got, Adam? Oh, lots of things. Um, <laughs> we, uh, let's, we'll stay on this a little bit more. So as we are, at least for us, our pricing has been pushed a little bit by our labor, which is how we started this whole thing. And um, what I found, especially this year, is when we, when we hire the best guys, we get the best product, right? Obviously, and that makes enough sense. When you have the best product, you can charge more. So that helps with the perceived value conundrum a little bit. Uh, well, a lot, actually, because so, it's a huge value to, to just take care of people and be able to say your house is going to look great and you won't have any issues. Um, part of what I'm wondering is how temporary is this push? How long can this possibly continue, especially from the laborer standpoint? And especially as more professional companies enter the market who are using a sub model or something like that, um, I wonder... I wonder at what point does it stop or is there a market correction where people can't continue doing what they've been doing and charging what they've been doing because the free money is not running around. And then in all, all of that considered, should we basically overpay for labor right now, eat the margin and build an all-star team that's going to be loyal to us for decades, right? Or years at least. And yeah. in two years, now we've got this great team. The pricing has sort of settled down. They're not pushing for more dollars. And now we've got the best, the best team in the market, great pricing, and now the influx of more labor. So 
that's one of the things I'm thinking about is, you know, it might just, and, and for us too, as a young company, um, where we're not hitting the margin that we want to be hitting, but I'm okay with that because our pricing will catch up and it is catching up slowly, but surely, um, I'd rather have the team built and overpay our guys to build that loyalty and make sure they know that this is where they want to stay. Lot, yeah, there's a lot there. So <clears throat> the good, I, I think the first thing I thought of was the good part is at least for me in the next five to 10 years, I don't feel like there's going to be too much labor in the trades unless some crazy market correction happens where unemployment goes to 10% again. Uh, we have a housing crisis, some some horrible stagflation, inflation, recession sort of thing happens again. Uh, and then I think that will force more people into the trades just because there's not a lot here. So I think for the foreseeable future, um, the demand will be high enough where we can, that's one variable that we might not have to worry about. And that that how that takes form is we're probably not going to have to worry about leads as much as other things for the next five to 10 years, which is okay. Mm -hmm. But we do have to worry about labor. Now, I would argue that you're assuming that people know if they're being overpaid or not. If they so in the mind, if in the mind of somebody who would be employed by somebody else, they will never be overpaid ever. There will never be a time in their life where they're where they're they perceive an overpayment. So the problem is if that's what you offer them, that's the new baseline. And I've seen data point after data point after data point, my company, other people's companies, where you can say, Listen, you don't know this, but this is an insanely high wage for this, for no experience. You have health insurance, you have retirement, paid time off, paid lunches, all this other stuff. This is crazy. Look around and they can say, yeah, exactly. That's why I'm here. It's really good. When they agree to that, that's their new baseline. Everything from there is, yes, that if you give me 30, I perceive it just as like if you gave me 15, we're going to be needing those same amount of pay increases over. What you'll never get is I understand that I am being paid a lot of money. This is a unique experience. And I will take that into account when I think about this job and the pay in the future. That will never happen. So yeah, yeah. I would say I would make the argument that we are paying really well, but we would never call what we do overpayment. Like you could make the argument that for some for some positions in my company, there is overpayment because we have such a training company. You know, we gather up people and do that. But from the employee's point of view, you will never get that argument. Yeah. Yeah. I think that therein lies the problem where you're assuming that everybody is a rational employee or employer and they know that. So I would say that's not a given that if you increase your pay, you're going to get better people. I think if you increase your pay, people, everybody will just take more pay. And right. I think it's hard. And until you get them in your company and suss them out, you won't know if they're the A players or not. I think that's yeah. the problem. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the, the interesting thing there too, with, I don't know if people are using subs. We, we really started using an interview process, a really robust and in-depth interview process. I mean, it's nothing too crazy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's a phone interview and a sit down interview and then yeah. starting a small job. I mean, that's it. But yeah. boy, when you get no showed for an interview, you're glad it wasn't a job. <laughs> so that's it's, it. Small uh, it's eliminated. It is almost entirely eliminated job no shows this year. Um, so you you tell me this is interesting because you talked about perceived value and one of the biggest things for me uh, and I'm I'm learning more and more that you know when I general contracted my own house it wasn't a technical job it was a people management thing. When I start a painting business, it's not necessarily a technical job. It's a people management business. When you start subcontracting, it is not a technical job. It's a people management business. So just like consumers, subcontractors are technically our consumers at some point. And the price, we are theirs also. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. In some cases, we're their only client, right? Yes. Yeah. So what's interesting is that you can provide perceived and real value to your subcontractors, just like you do your clients. And one of the things in interviewing and vetting subs this year is, is fine. Price is like, price seems to be the least of their concerns, just my client, just like my clients. What they want is no, no surprises and they want payment right away. Yeah. And yeah. you can, it, it feels like if, if, if there is, us and you, do you pay right away when when a job is done? Do you have some process oh, yeah. at the end of it? Okay, so again, we'll talk about that. But yeah, you you say that, 
with with authority. And that's one of the things that we locked on to early was when we were vetting subs, one of the big things was I've been burned by horrible versions of you over the years. And if you cannot burn me and I can trust you, that provides so much value to me. So in the end, there, there could be the evil Nick Slavic out there who charges the same price. There could be the good Nick Slavic out there who charges the same price. And if I paid them when the job is done versus the evil Nick Slavic that does it like 60 to 90 days, they'll take my price, maybe even a little less to have a relationship and have that payment. So again, it's, it's, our, our clients want something. Interestingly enough, I, I actually put this into my estimating master's class, which is every question a subcontractor asks you, every question a client asks you, if you keep asking why, eventually you get to the question of, are you going to take advantage of me? And it feels like everything, every interaction with a client, when they talk about the process and things like that, eventually comes back to that. And if you just know that, digest it, internalize it, and treat your answers like you're answering that question, it feels like you get a lot better response. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> and I, so for I talked to one of our subs who's phenomenal, and um, he did like three or four jobs with us. And then he's like, look, man, I'm not making the money that I that I I'm used to, and he's got work out the wazoo also. Like he is not hurting for work. And um, we went and sat down and, and I mean, his quality is phenomenal. His, his work ethic is unreal. Um, we sat and talked and I said, why are we even having this conversation? Like why, if, if we're not paying you what you can make and what other people will pay you, why are we even sitting here? And he's like, well, when the job is done, I tell the project manager the job is done and he runs to the bank and drops me a check. I mean, that's all. Nobody does that. You know? Yeah. And that was his like key thing. And I'm like, that's it. I mean, that's all we're doing. But now this, I mean, gem of a painter, one of the best painters I've ever seen in my life mm -hmm. is committed to us as long as we pay him fairly or we'll, and pay him his wage, right? His And his yeah. wage is high, but we exactly. have jobs where he's a great fit. The other thing is we don't have to keep him busy because he's plenty busy. So when it's the right job, we can get him on, know it's going to get taken care of. Um, and it's been great. But it was just a really, it was really eye-opening for me to say, what is it about us that you enjoy working with or that, that even makes you want to be here? The other thing, um, as like you said, is people management, not necessarily technical management. Mm -hmm. um, I spent probably, so we just hired a project manager. He started at the end of April, um, right before kind of we kicked things off, or no, end of March, right before we kicked things off. And, uh, before that, I really wanted to dial in quality control because uh, it was a huge, I mean, it's, it's a huge issue. Um, huge. And with subs, it's very important to me because I wasn't able to be as present on the job site last year when I was kind of doing everything. Mm -hmm. So I talked to you and about 20 other painters around the country and just asking everybody, like, how do you deal, how do you nail this down? How do you control production? How do we get this thing systematized to the point that it's the same every time? I mean, is it an operating procedure? Is it something else? And overwhelmingly, I was dissatisfied with the answers because everybody's like, here's some stuff you can do and it helps. But what I found was um, nothing replaced the presence of an actual human being on the job site. And that's where our philosophy is every job every day for our project manager. Mm -hmm. You're on every job every single day physically on site and present. Mm -hmm. um, if you show up and the guys aren't there, that was not wasted time because now you know that the guys aren't there, right? If you show up and they've got a question, great. If you show up and they're doing great work, great. All of that is great. It builds the relationship. It gets questions answered for the guys. They can keep working because they don't have to text you mm -hmm. or, or ask questions because they know you're coming. Um, so that is a that has been a game changer this year is job every day. And that's um, our... Uh, and I also heard, I don't remember where it was, um, because I'm one of the overdrive podcasts, somebody's called their project manager or quality manager. And I'm going to steal from that. Because mm, that's okay. way better than, uh, than project managers. Like, yeah. 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 Like managing quality, not the project. Right. So, um, so there's some thoughts there. I like it, man. What else you got? Let's do... Um, well, here's this is probably a shorter question. Um, as people are getting started, and then we'll get into the the deeper one of restarting. But 
as people are getting started, what do you see people wasting time on um, or spending time on that they um, that they're doing improperly at the beginning as they're building their companies? Okay, uh, counterintuitive from somebody who is a martyr for the craft and has devoted their entire life to the molecular science of coatings. People spend way too much time on thinking quality and the price of paint is the thing that will make them more money. Um, in, in reality, uh, I use that scale of zero to 100. Zero being the worst paint job ever, 100 being perfect. Theoretically impossible, right? Nobody's perfect. And if I go out, I can do something between a 98 on every job. I can see where all the problems lie ahead. I can hyper-focus on those things, do a good job. My craftspeople can probably do between, you know, an 85 and a 95, give or take. And I have burned down versions of my company over and over because people couldn't do a 98 instead of an 88. Uh, my apprentices can probably do a 78, 75, give or take. The problem is clients only want a 65 most of the time, if we're being honest. They are so underserved. And 65 doesn't mean it's a D plus. 65 is a insanely good paint job. The problem is I start ratcheting up quality over and above what is considered like something all painters and craftspeople can be proud of. People think that going from a 65.75 to a 98, they can double their prices. They cannot because perceived value. Yeah. A great example of that, and this is something that I toiled on for years and years and years. When I would do a standard exterior repaint, we're talking just a Rambler, a story and a half, a house that's three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars in Minnesota, just a standard sort of, you know, not an entry level home or just a little bit above. We used to wash, we used to scrape, we used to sand the whole thing within an inch of its life, prime it, caulk every little hairline crack in the house, apply two coats of premium paint. And at the end of it, the feedback I got, Adam, was that took you forever. <laughs> and I was like, yes, we are doing a world class job. It's like and I, I would I would anecdotally say to the clients, like, yeah, finally, we're getting that second coat on. We're going to be out of here in no time. And they're like, you put two coats of paint on? And I was like, that's, I thought that's why I got the job. Because I'm doing two coats of a paint that's technically a one coat paint. We're doing all this extra stuff. My lesson from it with those exteriors was clients saw no value in all the amazing sanding and caulking and all this other stuff we were doing. Now, what I don't do now is a fire sale apartment repaint project. We took out or modified or took as options, caulking, sanding, all the crazy stuff we used to do, and just put them as options on the estimate instead. So now we can get a streamlined product. I doubled my exterior prices. We did 30% less work and clients are still happy and we still have a full schedule. So mm -hmm. I, if you think you can, if you think you can make more money by ratcheting up quality, the answer is yes, you can but you get diminishing returns at some point. At some point when yeah. you get into the 90s, clients have no idea you're in the 90s. <laughs> yeah. Well, in time, like you said, knowing what's actually important to people, I get asked every single time, how long do you think it's going to take? And, and it kind of blows my mind. Like, why? I mean, I don't know. Why do you, why do you, why, you know, why do you care? You don't want to, I guess they don't want us here for the month or they yeah. just don't know. And they're just curious. And I don't know, maybe I'm the only one who gets asked that every time. No, I have, I have such a unique piece of data for you. Um, last year, I, I believe that your your job description, my job description, one thing on there should be pattern recognition so that we can start sensing out the friction and then solving for it. Because it's not the painter's you know, uh, purview to, to sense out the market price of a project. Last year, the biggest thing that came up every single time was we need an exact start date and an exact stop date. And those two dates must be very close together. <laughs> like you are not, I mean, we could tell people, okay, listen, high risk here. We're going to give you a start date. And then we're going to give you that end date for that whole house trim project. It's going to be five and a half weeks. And they're like, no, it's not. It's going to be three. And we say, no, it's not. We can't <laughs> do it. But the irrational, I, I won't call it a rationality. I will call it husband, wife, spouses, kids, dogs, everybody at home, nobody leaving. They're home to see this now. Harken back to a time, Adam Weinzettel, in 2019, when we used to have vacant homes to paint in, when people used to go to work, this novel thing of traveling to work, and we would have a vacant home. People honestly didn't care as much how long we were there because they're not there. By the time they got home, they were gone. Last year, they hyper-focused on 
start, stop, that must be close. So yeah. sounds like you had the same experience. <laughs> yeah, the, well, and, and I don't have much experience pre-COVID. I mean, people ask me all the time, like, yeah, how did how did COVID impact your business? I said, well, we grew five times, but we were pretty small before. So like, I don't, I don't think it really had an impact. I don't know. No, no. Everybody else says it was okay. So I guess it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, ask them. But. All right. So then um, the, so I prepped Nick for this question a little bit, but um, in the event, so imagine like tomorrow you show up and there's a mass mutiny at your company yeah. and all of your systems are stolen. Your war room is stolen. Everything is stolen. Your people are gone and it's now just you and a paintbrush and you have to rebuild from the ground up. You you have no website. I mean, no, nothing. Mm -hmm. And you start over from scratch. What What's your process like? How do you walk through that? Are we at least assuming, Adam, that I know how to paint? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm assuming that you know everything you know right now, but okay. like you can't oh. just recreate your master SOP, right? You can't just rebuild the systems overnight. Yeah, this is one. I would I would double my prices. I would hyper focus on a few bread and butter jobs and I would I would make a very large margin. I would get out there probably for the first uh, year, get some cash coming in. I would immediately start hiring on um, decent human beings again and basically do the same thing that took me 29 years in the trade, you know, in probably about a year. And I would have no head trash about bringing people on now because I know that, you know, a, a hyper producer like myself, I can produce between, you know, 180 and $220 of revenue an hour. I can support somewhere between three and six people learning how to paint and still make an industry average margin by overproducing myself while they have the time to do that. So in looking back over the numbers, that's what I did to grow my first 10 painters. And I would just grid it through to 10 and then hire a production manager again. Mm -hmm. That's what I would do. And uh, yeah, but the, the tactical things I would do would be the things that I know now that I did not know back then is that I could probably grow to half a million dollars just on word of mouth referral and organic leads. I wouldn't have to get out there and make some crazy marketing scheme. Like the work's always going to be there. If people know your painter, they'll find you. And I would basically go on a zero marketing budget for the first half a million. And then I would just get out there and hyper focus on probably trim wall cabinets, and exteriors and decks, just kind of bread and butter residential repaint and just go for it like that again. Mm -hmm. So even with your experience with subs now, you'd focus on the, the employee route? Yeah, so I would, I would do that. Um, I would not build a fully, I, I would probably go down the road of those right away. I, I, would, I would go down both roads right away, but I would, I would want a solid base of at least a few a few employees so that i can be freed up to do the subcontracting thing then as well so i would pursue both avenues because it's not people always ask what's better and it's like well they're all different and subs will do things that employees can't and employees will do things that subs can't and i see them both as ways that we can make happier clients so mm -hmm. yeah likewise but yeah i would i would i would know now i would be way more confident about what we're doing. I know work is not going to dry up. I know we can do a good job and I know at what level we can perform and still make happy clients. And I would get out there and do that a lot of it. And I would not, I would stop having head trash about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to, I, I like your thought process of, yeah, go and work and bootstrap and pad cash because that's the right way to grow, you know? Um, well, listen, there's there's a couple there's a couple ways to grow, right? You can use your effort or your money. And I don't mind putting forth the effort. And uh, I, I'm still doing this now where you're I'm gritting through, I'm taking on multiple job descriptions, and then my my litmus test of adding overhead, and this is just my personality, when that overhead is added, and overhead can be a production manager, an estimator, a coordinator, there should be immediate relief. And that's how that's a proof of concept because I, I maybe don't trust myself as much as I should. I need that immediate relief to prove that what I'm doing is like, okay, there's the proof right there. I have a much harder time, like if I were to hire four people on the leadership team and then build the company up around it, that to me is a lot squishier way to do. And it, it's a different risk and reward profile. I'm willing to grit through a, fray, a phase and then offload stuff. So. Right. 
Yeah, and I sort of take the opposite approach of not that I don't want to grit. We're definitely gritting, but yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. Um, but I think the I love the idea of using money to scale as far yeah. right instead of. I mean, geez, I think I've bought every well, not every course that you can buy. Or I mean, <laughs> I buy in books and um, and and coaching and marketing coaches and just all sorts and these and the technology and trying to just fuse it all together. And my, my grit and time is spent sort of piecing together a Tetris of a system with all of your knowledge and everybody else's knowledge and saying, yeah. hey, how do you just condense all of this, which is why I'm talking to so many people all over. And that's why I'm so excited for the residential forum. Just go down and I mean, I'm going to make a, a list of pepper questions is what I'm calling them that I can pepper people with. I'm just like awesome. the 10 questions I want to ask every single person who is more successful than me, which is going to be everybody, I think, at the conference. So it's, it's going to be like, okay, guys, let's, let's talk about this. And, and then condensing and putting it together. So utilizing other people's expertise, which again, is a gift of this industry um, mm -hmm. that, that it's so open and that everybody wants everybody to do well. And there's just the abundance of it. So, so I think that's, so I think that's really fascinating. Um, and so, and I remember, you may not remember this, but about a year and a half ago, I think we were on the phone and I didn't have any in-house employees at that point. And I said, you know, if you had to, if you had to hire again, what would be your first hire? And do you remember what you said or? I'm going to guess. And if, it, if, if, if I did not say painter, I may say production, somebody on the production team. Is that right? It was more creative than that. It was really? A, it was a task rabbit. Ah, the, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, um, you, cause you said your specific point was, and it was more of a thought experiment. I think it was like, um, yeah. production manager or task rabbit, just somebody who can do these little things as we need them done and who can fill in those gaps and free up the time to be able to, to do that. And, um, I thought that was really creative. Um, What's really interesting is I still think about that position every day. The problem is it takes a very unique human to do it. Um, mm -hmm. They need to be completely open-minded. They need to be completely optimistic. They have to be fine walk, opening a door and not knowing what's on the other side and then dealing with it confidently, which the reason I haven't hired that position, that is a tough one because it might be talk to a, con a client. It might be doing production work. It might be adding a room onto a house for an estimate. It might be touching up paint and that's a very, I mean, if you could find somebody who could function in that, that would, that would take care of 10% of some of the most laborious little weird tasks that we do. Boy, I found that that is a, that, that is a unicorn position if I've ever seen it. And that's probably yeah. why we don't have it. <laughs> do you, I mean, do you feel like you can, I feel like you can make a job description for that. I mean, the hard thing is, is yeah. really uh, maybe, and maybe affording is the wrong thing. I mean, as far as justifying the expense of that, right? The immediate relief, like you talked about yeah. being able well, to really quantify what this person's pay should be to do. The, the problem work. is try to come up with a KPI for that. You know oh, what I mean? Sure. Like yeah. that, that's yeah. squishy. And that's, that's the test of a good job description, which is it's a light switch test. Come Monday morning at our meeting. Can we determine whether you did your job or not? And it's yeah. like, you can say you saved the production team some time doing stuff, but then all of a sudden you can find sneaky works around. like, they don't need that tool brought to them. Just send the lowest paid painter back or something, or just go buy one at the nearest store. You know what I mean? Right, so it's right. like, that still would be a very valuable thing. And I, I think that it would become even more valuable as we're bigger. I think the reason we can't quantify it now is because there's, there's a random amount of tasks that aren't grouped by type. If we were double our size now, there would be enough of those tasks where you can say, okay, here's your four areas of key accountabilities, yeah. <laughs> supporting painters, supporting production, supporting estimating teams, supporting the shop. And here's other things we see right now. It's so random. We, we might get a one support task for the shop one day and then painters the next day. So I feel that I still feel, and the army has this, that I, I this is a, a thing that I had learned from the army. They have something called QRF quick reaction force, mm -hmm. where there's people who have guard duty. There's people who do the chow line. There's people who do, you know, medical and then there's this pile of guys that just sit there and whatever happens they're like don't be surprised when we call you you're gonna have to open that door and see what's on the other side and just help because we need more humans and that's sort of the thing i like <laughs> maybe, maybe you need a, a qrf guy right i mean go find Honestly, a guy 
There is, we, yeah, what we need to do is find a guy who's been an infantry soldier for somewhere between three and seven years in the army, got out and is not, I mean, that's your whole, I feel like your whole life in the army is QRF, which you stand around and do nothing. And then somebody screams at you and you do some random tasks you never could have thought of. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it, it, I think it's going to be there. This may even take the 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 place. Uh, I mean, you can imagine a scenario where you have a personal assistant to the leadership team, yeah. where it's it's not necessarily a painting task. It's basically there's a whole bunch of weird randomness on a leadership team between an admin, production, and estimator, and then management. And there might just be a random list of assistanty sort of stuff too. Eventually, so I don't know. It's a weird it's a weird thing, but I still like the idea. Yeah. Well, and it might even be. Um an intern internship. I That's mean, true. you could, cause you true. could call it a, like a associate entrepreneur internship and say, Hey, guess what entrepreneurship is. You wear every hat. So you do whatever I tell you all year. No and, and, and a sophomore entrepreneurship major from, you know, any of the schools around here would probably be up for it. I, you know, I mean, maybe that's an idea. I, uh, you might have to explore that. So I like that. Well, it's interesting. Uh, now I'm now I'm connecting some dots because our local high school has an entrepreneurship program, and they and they talk. I've been involved with it for a couple of years, and they finally asked me if I wanted an intern this year, and the answer was always yes. We'll figure something out. So that might be an interesting thing because then you could give them an, a a good thing in like we're not going to give them painters whites and throw them in the field, but it might right. be good to show up on the last day of a big project and see how touch ups go. Right, and then right. also order paint and then also go on an estimate. So, yeah, I, I kind of like that idea. That's a, that's well, not a bad idea, Adam. And I think that part of it, too, is what's the KPI for the business owner, right? And and maybe that matches up in this position. Is yeah. like your your position is to – maybe your two KPIs are um, – I, I, well, maybe we'll talk about what's the, what is the KPI for, yeah. for the business owner. But then the second one being time saved, right? How much, how much of my time have you saved by existing in our company? Um, what do you, what do you, what is, what's your KPI? <laughs> oh, you asked, you asked a, such a, no. Okay. So this is the easiest question on earth, right? But it's also very hard. I actually wrote my own job description this year and mm -hmm. I find out that, you know, cause I've offloaded painting for the most part, I've offloaded production, I've offloaded estimating for the most part, but my biggest job description right now is, um, like tactical job is coordinator. Like legitimately, I am the admin for my company right now. And when we do the turkey truck test, Adam, the first thing that would happen is that the admin thing would fall short. Like, you know, it, there, we have everything set up automated in a way where there would be enough payroll for somewhere between six months to a year. But because the admin duties don't get done somewhere about four to six months from now, the company would start feeling it. You know what I mean? Like there would be some tactical breakdown where nobody has that job description. So my my KPIs are really interesting because I still sell some, you know, for, for our relationship clients and things like that. Um, I'm sort of final arbiter of quality control. You know, um, I'm finance. <laughs> I'm HR. I'm coordination. I am visionary because somebody has to look to the future to see what we're doing here. <laughs> I am recruiter. I am onboarder. I am overseeing the apprenticeship program. Uh, I'm facility management. I'm generally overseeing fleet management while the tactical fleet management gets done by somebody else. But you can start, you can start saying, I mean, you could make an argument. I, if I showed up at the residential forum and say, I don't do any of the painting. I don't do any of the production. I don't do any of the estimating. People would be like, wow, you've run a professionalized business. The company doesn't need you. And I would say, not if you write down my job description, it doesn't. There's still a lot of things. So my, my KPIs are really weird, where I actually have a KPI for how much I still need to sell or want to sell um, the finances of the company. And overall, when you overlay, you know, the coordination stuff of getting to the leads and, and coordinating that, essentially, when you get down to the bottom of that, those are tactical things. The management level KPI I have is net profit, just like you. And that's never going to go away. Like when I, when I divest myself from every single thing in this company, it's not because I want to go away. It's because I want to spend more time on focusing on the net profit so that we can are, so that we can offer higher pay, you know, benefits, health insurance, retirement, things like that. So really that's like, yeah, there's tactical stuff and then there's the higher level stuff. How about, how about you right now? Yeah. I, uh, there's a really interesting, um, 
set of books. So if you heard of traction, it's like Gino Wickman was a coach under this system beforehand. So it ended up mastering the Rockefeller habits, if you've heard of it by Vern yeah. Varnish. Um, they had a second book that they came out with called Scaling Up. And it's one of the most dense business books I've ever encountered. I mean, there is zero fluff in this book. I mean, it's just like, it's unreal. And I listened to the audio version and then I went and bought the the actual book because I'm like, I need to read this and study this. It's like a textbook. I mean, it's unbelievable. Wow. Concepts are not unfamiliar, um, but the way they frame it is really unique and they've got a lot of tools that are, that are really helpful, similar to traction tools, mm -hmm. um, but a, a little bit more nuanced, I think. One of his points that was really insightful was he said the, the KPI or the accountability measure for the CEO is um, the percentage of people who are in the right place in the company and doing the right things. And now he's like talking about like, a company that's kind of scaling and scaling and scaling and, and a larger mid cap company kind of, um, which is not us necessarily. We're not quite there, but mm -hmm. his, but that that philosophy of you know what the job of the of the CEO the owner is to make sure that everybody's in the right place and doing the right things right, and to the extent that you can measure that, you know how well you're doing. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. So I'm trying to adopt that mindset um, for myself, you know, while also having a responsibility to. I mean, it's hard to assign a KPI that's not net profit. Yeah, so that's that's a good. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, when I when I said visioning for the future, that I, I probably should have spent a little more time on that because legitimately, we have to architect the skeleton of the company, and one of those things is the org chart, right? Like that. That's one of the most basic, simple things that we can do, which is not just gathering up people and doing stuff, but having knowing how much painters produce, knowing how mu how many production people you need to manage the quality and the revenue there, knowing how much work needs to be estimated and then having a person do that and then having all those incentives align so that when something goes right, everybody's incentive properly or everybody's incentivized right to the overall goals of the company, which is that net profit. Because that is truly the reason that companies are here is to provide that net profit and then do with it what you want, you know? Right, right. Yeah, I think it's a... Uh... I don't know. It's it's a fascinating thing, especially I think as a as a young business owner, to try to figure out. And when you are wearing all these different hats and you're doing, yeah. all the, I mean, I'm not doing necessarily all the hats that you're wearing, because um, we don't have that kind of, we don't have a shop space, we don't have a fleet, we don't have any of that, right? And we're not even handling pickup of materials, so it's it's a lot. It's different, but um, I don't know. It's well, what's no what's interesting is that so let's just a, a good way of building a good way of building your job description is uh, so this year I mean I we obviously know what our job descriptions are right there's things that have to be done when I had to write it down I I only got about half right on my first draft hmm. and then what I did was as I was made to do things I wrote those down too so whether you like it or not it's a very easy system to figure out what the owner or the proprietor or the visionaries thing is, which is what are you forced to do that something bad doesn't happen? No. And, there you go. and and so I actually feel out the, I'm still 10% close to getting my own job description right, but the next 40% of that came real quick as I was like, oh, that's a thing I forgot to write down, but I had to do today, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I have a couple of quick questions for you and then there's one final one that, that is gonna be the, the biggest one, but um, what recommended books do you have? Things that you've read that have really impacted you? Yeah, so I am not a big fan of business books, right? Like I, I, I went deep. So when, when we go to residential forum, a lot of guys will be like, oh my God, here's the eight greatest books. There's things like that. And yes, you run across some good things, but a lot of them, a lot of them are a lot of fluff and you'll maybe only take away one interesting point. Um, honestly, traction for me has been, it fits my personality, which is it's cold, it's clinical, it's utilitarian and it's like not perfect. It's not in the most insanely robust thing, but it takes all the chaos of what the hell is all this about? And it says, here's a path for the next couple of years for you. And that honestly, it hit me at that time where I was gritting through between 10 and 20 painters myself. 
I had all the hats. I didn't even know what this was supposed to look like. And that just said, here, sprinkle this framework over it. Uh, it was like immediate relief. Like, okay, yeah. let's try yeah. this. Um, one of the one of the books that I'm trying to work through right now. Also, by the way, I just took a second to write down uh, scaling up because I will take a book recommendation from you. <laughs> I will not always take a book recommendation from other people, but that is now on my list. Um, I I am actually going through. I've been trying to reach outside of like obviously outside of the painting industry, obviously outside of even business. And just going for economic stuff. I like principles of economics because they're just truths, human truths. And one of the books I'm reading is Algorithms for Life. And it's it's such an interesting book because it overlays super high level economics, but in a way that we can sort of understand it. So the best example from that book and what probably made it famous is called The Optimal Stop. And I'm going to butcher all this stuff. If Jason Paris was here, he'd be thrown into a trash can. Listen to me trying to describe this. But it's like the optimal thought stop theory or the optimal stop problem where they can actually quantify with economics, data, statistics, how long you should look for something before you stop and take the next best option. And this is it's hilarious because you can even talk about finding a spouse. And what they came up with was, I mean, you can it. they call it the secretary problem, right? Because they've been studying this for decades and it is hard science now. How long should you take applicants for a secretary position or a spouse position before you either pick one that you interviewed or you take the next best option. Because the problem is sometimes we can say, well, I'm just going to keep going until I find the right one. Well, you probably passed on a whole bunch of people. What they said, Adam, use 37% of your allowable time or money budget to find something. And then if you haven't found one, then take the next best one. And optimally, if you do that over your entire life, you will make the most efficient decisions. Huh. It's, I love stuff. Now, again, we know that that's not perfect. You may wait 30 years and then find the perfect person. But statistically, if you did this over and over again, if you're searching for a restaurant on the road, you say, I got an hour to my destination, you know, or I got a hundred minutes to my destination. And I want to yeah. find a restaurant. If you haven't found one in the first 37 minutes, go to the next one, because you know what, you're going to get to your destination, not finding anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, that's, that's wild. That's yeah, really, that seems low, but uh, to me, but I don't know. But again, I, I like when you take the weirdest, yeah. squishiest, most irrational thing, humans, and overlay some weird underlying, because we think humans are like this impossible problem when really it's always going to be squishy and irrational, but it's going to, you can overlay some principles on where you can push the odds in your favor a little bit, or at least not have a, what I try to never do is have a 100% feelings based approach to anything. I feel there's always a little chunk of data you can put in to help guide those feelings, right? Yeah. Well, and yeah. especially, I mean, I mean, I studied statistics in college a little bit and you got the, I don't know, when you start putting things on a macro level, it's kind of scary how predictable things are. I worked in life insurance for a little bit and it's like, that's a weird thing because you're like, very very desensitized to the fact that people die at a very predictable rate and it's kind of that's i don't know that's that's, that's dude that's, listen you i'm i'm not telling you anything you don't know then that is the most serial killer emotionless approach yeah. to human life ever is when you start looking at um stati uh, uh, statisticians and uh, what are, actuaries, actuaries and things yeah. like that's that. what i studied for in college at first so that was my, Ooh, that was my yeah. background <laughs> Yeah, so that is yeah, that is completely taking the human out of it, actually. And <laughs> no feeling. Yeah. It's a database discussion. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, man. How about so besides scaling up, if you had to point to one book that has impressed you the most or left the biggest impression, how what's that for you? Yeah, um, it's gonna be it's gonna be I, I've never heard anybody else actually recommend this book. Um, because I don't think most people know about it. And I, I'm I'm gonna well, I'll offer two authors. Okay, yep. that are very under the radar. One is Truett Cathy, who's the founder of Chick-fil-A. Um, he's oh, got yeah, about yeah. five books and I've read two or three. They're relatively short, they're phenomenal. Um, anybody who builds a company like Chick-fil-A, I feel like should be top of the bestseller list and he's not and I don't, and I can't quite figure out why. So um, anything by Truett Cathy, the, the first one I read was um, uh, Eat More Chicken, influence more people, I think is what the title is. So that's that's a good place to start. It's basically kind of an autobiography. And it only goes to like the middle of Chick-fil-A's growth. So you don't get the full story, but 
it gives you his background. It's amazing. The other one, and this is the, the more critical one that I would encourage everybody in the world to read, um, is Coach John Wooden, who coached the UCLA basketball team, won 10 national championships in 12 years. Um, arguably, he was voted greatest coach ever um, in that like process. But um, his books are unbelievably full of wisdom. Um, the one I recommend is, is Wooden, A Lifetime of Observations on and off the court. I think they just lost it on Audible or something because I couldn't find it on Audible, but you can find it on Amazon. And it is just a tiny book of wisdom mm. that is about team building and uh, and mentality of, towards success and his definition of success and the building blocks that it takes to achieve success in his mind is very, very counterculture. And I find that countercultural things often have a lot of truth in them. So um, very under the radar guys, but very, very phenomenal um, members of the greatest generation who, you know, came through and did some, they both did pretty amazing things and did it with a lot of humility. Yeah. Um, so I'll recommend those highly. Well, thank you for those. And I love stuff that goes outside. Like it's, I love it when people bring outlierish kind of stuff that you wouldn't, I mean, cause we can all tread over the same six books, like go in the business brush uh, group and just type book and you're going to find the same six books and they're good. They're fine. Right. But I like the outside stuff. That's yeah, really yeah. cool. I like it. So I took notes. I have those down now and probably somewhere between one and six years from now, I will read those. Yeah. So <laughs> I am not a voracious reader. Uh, yeah. We have so much to do in the business right now, but I will coming from you. I will definitely look those up. As so. The sooner you read them. And that was true at Kathy and John Wooden were the, were the authors. Um, awesome. All right. So then I've got a, I got one more big question for you. Yeah. That is my, uh, that's my Achilles heel. Oh. Um, as we're as we're growing the, so, and I was really interested to talk. Um, I'm interested to talk with Jason about this too, because I know both of you had this sort of. Um, I, we're talking about family um, and the and protecting that family time, and it's really easy. I feel like from my perspective to look and like you said, like you you if you went to the residential form, you're like I've got these things all checked off, and everybody's like, oh, you've got a systematized passive income, right? You're like, not exactly. And it's easy from, I feel like, the, the position of somebody young in the business to say, well, um, you do such a good job of protecting your family time. And Jason does as well. And I look at that and think, well, you guys are further ahead. Kind of easy for you to say, sort of. And mm -hmm. it's not. It's, it, and you have to make that intentional effort because you can grind forever and never um, never pull back and never set, never set your priorities that way. But for someone as, as I'm starting, and as we're still a young company and we're still growing and trying to get to this point where we're very, very stable and consistent uh, and scaling, it's sort of a, it's a tough question of, um, and, I, and I've set like a kind of a 5 p.m. stop time, which mm -hmm. I hold to pretty much. Yeah. Um, and it took some time when the baby was born as much as I kind of could until I had to yeah. kind of get back, back to it. Um, and I guess my question is, at what point, at what point can you actually do that? You know, and as you were making that transition, at what point is it like, you know, now we are at a, it, do you have to get to a stable income level or like the business is actually producing a certain um, net profit with my reasonable amount of work. Um, and so I'm not going to go and pull 60, 70, 80 hour weeks anymore because I, I'm going to protect this family time. Um, is it realistic as you're starting the company or do you have to sort of grit it out a little bit and say, you know what, we're going to take the next three years and we're going to do this and I'm going to pull in the 60 hours so that we can build the foundation necessary to really pull back and have that lifestyle. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So there's a lot to this, right? Um, I, I, claim to protect family time very closely. And I feel that I do. Uh, when I look to my peers, not even in the industry, but within the industry, and then just people who are school principals, athletic directors, marketing people, um, actuaries, things like that. Legitimately, I spend much more time with my family than most other humans I know, I, just, just as a percentage. 
The problem is, Adam, I still work at least 68 hours a week hmm. on average. And that's something when I wrote out my job description, I don't know that I've ever talked about this because this is this is uh, one of my personal goals this year is that I anybody can work more and get more results. And one of my personal goals now is you just need to be better. Uh, you need to figure out how to do this in somewhere between eight and 10 hours a day, four days a week. And if you can't do that, you're not doing it right. That's my new personal goal for myself. So while I am spending a lot of family time, evenings, Friday afternoons, all weekends, things like that, I am sacrificing a lot of time that I could be doing something else for the greater good of those around me uh, growing this business. And I will, I will use the excuse. It can be an excuse or a justification that it's to build a business so that it gets to the point where I can choose or not to choose to interact with it. And people will have more value than it does now. Employees, clients, everything else. Now, the effectiveness and how quick that happens is kind of up to us, right? So I, I am still a firm believer that there's you're going to get a whole bunch of data points out there. I have half a dozen data points of people who have somewhere between six and 20 employees where I would consider them to be very uh, they're either very good or very lucky. They might be a combination of both, but they found employees who don't need a lot of interaction. They find employees who take care of a lot of things themselves. And that way they don't need a lot of layers of management. So there's all sorts of people who I know there's a six person company that I know of where the, the home where the owner of the company, it basically break it down into two or three crews. Those crews are completely self-managing. They only need two to three jobs a week. And that, that business owner takes home $190,000 a year with almost no effort. He does all the estimates. He does all the coordination, but there's not a lot of estimating coordination to do. So there's one version of it. I know a version of a 20 person company where it is a office person. It is one person that used to be a painter that they promoted to kind of operations manager. And then that person does not basically work anymore. The leads come in, the estimates get done uh, by somebody else. And the, oh, I'm sorry, that person did have an estimator as well, too. So basically leads come in, the office coordinator uh, pushes the estimates out. That estimator sells a heck of a lot of work instead of having two operation or production team members. There's only one and they kind of take care of stuff. Uh, that is not the norm. Um, I found that that overwhelms people uh, generally in the industry. So I'm a, I'm a firm believer the more I look at it that, yes, uh, I am not planning on getting lucky and having people who can super produce and will stay forever because statistically it's not going to be a thing. I would, we will take that. Um, but I'm a firm believer in the five key positions in the company being filled before somebody can legitimately achieve a status where they can choose or not to choose to interact with a company. And I think that's what we're all kind of looking for, which is if you're forced to do something in the company, it feels different than when you choose. So visionary integrator, I think you got to have production, you got to have admin, and you got to have estimating. Mm -hmm. And the integrator, if you can, if you can fill that role, will likely hold those three groups or buckets accountable. You just need to hold the integrator accountable. And I think that's where we can step back and we can look at the data that's coming in for our company and then pattern recognize and then give the integrator some guidance as to saying, this is not working. This is working. Let's address this. And then they go do it. Most business owners time gets sucked up between putting fires out. And what we need to do is have enough people in the company with KPIs that align with the business. So the fires get put out at a tactical and, and first level management area so that we can then free ourselves up to then architect the org chart and make sure that we, we oversee everything else. And the reason people get frustrated and can't grow is because they are stuck delivering paint to a job site and they don't that that's not bad, but it's that you're taking time from something that you really should be doing because you're the only person that has that other job. There's anybody else in the company can get the paint. So yeah. legitimately, I think once you fill those positions, you can have a very small company and do that. But legitimately, I think that crosses the two million dollar mark. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at, at a minimum and how effective you can be and how simple your systems are will make that a very small management team or if it's just ragtag with no written down processes that's going to be a very bloated team with friction so 
I don't know. That that that's a that's an involving thought. What what are you when I say that? What's your reaction? Yeah, I think that I think you're right on a lot of it. Um, I, I I like that framework that you built as far as production estimating and admin with an integrator above, which you call a general manager or whatever, you know. But um, and that's sort of what I feel uh, I'm working to build in that structure because we have. We have our production manager right now who's, who's doing great, our um, office manager admin who's part-time right now because we don't have a full-time. We don't, we don't need him full-time yet. Um, and then I'm doing all the estimating still, and which is driving me crazy because I want to be up here, right? I want to be integrating and, and yeah. doing the, the coaching and the team building and the system building, but I'm spending all my time doing estimates, which is great and necessary and important. But it drives me crazy because <laughs> because it's not yes. where I want to land. I want to be in the integrator role and then eventually the visionary role. Um, so so I think that's right on. Um, and and I think the two million dollar mark is right. Also, one of the tricks for us. I mean, we're trying to we're trying to break past a million this year. We we're about half a million last year. We're trying to push past that, um, and we're behind. Hence all the sales. Yeah, because we were because I spent all my time training at the beginning of the year, right? And so then it took some time for us to get get going and to um, iron things out to where it wasn't just my brain on paper; it was my brain on paper adjusted to account for another human being doing this job. Mm -hmm. You know, so that was really critical, and we're going to need that for the salesperson as well. But when we can do that, um, well, and I, so I'm hoping we can push past the million kind of at where we're at now because we're at an interesting spot where if we don't, and this is the risk of hiring too quickly, if we don't, this is actually a volume game. People say profit's more important than revenue. Well, unless you have a really high overhead, in which case it doesn't matter how great your margin is. If you don't have enough of it, you don't pay the bills. That's it. Um, so you have to hit, we, we have a certain amount, like this is our bottom line break mm -hmm. that we must hit this year. And then beyond that, we start to become profitable Mm -hmm. And have a lower profit year in an effort to scale and set it up to where next year we can push to two million with this team, sort yeah, of the grid, yeah. right? With me filling in gaps here to help us get to that point. Um, so I think you're right on, and it, it's it's I think also it's um, maybe comforting and uh, well revealing to for you to say like I, Ed, I'm still putting in the hours, right? You you know you're not done, and I think that I'm. Maybe I'm just inspired enough by there are enough people running passive businesses that there is a set of structures yeah. um, and passive, passive, right? I mean, we're, we're not talking about the zero involvement here. Mm -hmm. um, we talked, I mean, your definition is really good um, as far as what that looks like. But yeah, I think that I think it's being done enough in enough industries that we're starting to see patterns and you're starting to see patterns. yeah and i think it comes down at the end of the day are you is your is your sales rate is your, is your pricing good enough where you can profitably sell these jobs because we make our money on the sale yeah. not on the not in the production right you can lose money in the production but the job is profitably won when you sell it at a profitable rate um so there's that point and then having well-defined job descriptions with a KPI on Monday morning, can we tell, if, did you do your job? And if you can do that, then you should be able to fill those roles with competent people mm -hmm. who fit your culture, who can execute that business plan with coaching, right? With coaching, always. Yeah. So I, I think it's, so I think it's, yeah, I think it's insightful. And I think there are a lot of patterns. I think that we, uh, I, I mean, I, yeah, I sort of think all the time, like, ah, if I just went and I should just build some kind of a product and sell it online. Like that would be easier, but you're still dealing with people. You still have to build systems. Eventually you have to hire. You can't just, there's no easy way to do this. It's just hard sometimes. It's much larger investment. You know, again, if you and I want to start a bank, that is a way harder entrance scheme than it is to be a painter. Because for painters, you and I probably have a ladder in our garage and we definitely have a vehicle and congratulations. That's, that's the startup cost of a painting company. So it's it's way easier to do this than a lot of other things. And sort of the litmus test that I use with my 68 hours a week is, do I look forward to it? And the answer is yes. I tremble with delight when I do my work. And so that lets that still lets me know that 
this is exciting. We're getting results. We're progressing. I feel that it's time to permanently reschedule my day when I do not look forward to that stuff, honestly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's what I'm using as my bellwether going forward. Right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Adam Weinzettel, we have gone an hour and a half. Uh, what, what, any last words from you uh, for the good viewers of Ask a Painter? Yeah, you know, I think that um, on this topic is um, our, our, what's really important, right? And we spend a lot of time working in our lives. We spend a lot of time. I mean, I love it too. I mean, I love what I do. I love having these conversations. I love this trade. I love this yeah. business. It's just a ton of fun. Um, but we spend a lot of time on it. And it's really easy to get caught up in it um, and even to be spending extra time, you know, reading and learning and having the, well, well I'm, I'm learning, right? I'm, I'm building into the business. You maybe should be doing something else with your time sometimes. Um, and I think that for us, it's always just really important to keep that perspective. Um, there's only so much that uh, actually matters here and uh, I forget it you know, several times a week, if not several times a day, and need to be reminded constantly that at the end of the day, um, I've got three little girls downstairs, well, two little girls and a bigger girl, I guess, but yeah. <laughs> down downstairs, and I'm excited to go spend my Saturday with them and yeah. not work, yeah. you know, and that's a gift. So, um, and, and all the problems will be there on Monday. Yeah. And again, it's just pain, right, Adam? So interestingly enough, I I got gapped, which is which is a saying I've loved to come, uh, I've loved uh, to have been introduced to this last year. Where, you know, there's a difference between what you're doing and maybe what you want to do, and the gap is, you know, you get gapped by somebody showing you what that looks like. Yeah. And I had one of the most interesting visits I've had in a very long time. Uh, somebody came down and spent an afternoon with me, and one of the ways that they judge success for themselves is one of the coolest ways I've ever heard anybody describe this, which is it's not what you do. It's what are you capable of? And are you living up to that capability? So it's it, like, you can say, Hey, I work down at the soup kitchen and that person would be like, fine. But what if your capabilities state that you should have created eight soup kitchens and oversaw them and ran them and then done the greater good? To me, that was like, oh, checking boxes is not a thing. Like on yeah. paper, yeah. you can be very good. Like you could say, hey, I spend more family time with my family than anybody I know. But what are you capable of? Mm -hmm. You might not want to judge yourself against what you find around you. You mm -hmm. know, so that was, oh, I got gapped big time. <laughs> and it made me rethink a lot about even just like what I'm doing. So, yeah. yeah. That's a good thing. So, all right, Adam Weinzettel, uh, thank you for doing this very much. I always look forward to our conversations because honestly, nobody comes with more thoughtful questions than you. Um, for the people who don't know this, Jason Paris was actually supposed to join us today, but he is feeling a little under the weather and we'll give him that grace. But I'm, I'm glad I got to get some selfish time with you to do this. That was awesome. <laughs> always a joy. Thank you so yeah. much. Mike. So everybody, PCA. If conversations like this are any interest to you, buckle up. The PCA Residential Forum in San Antonio is this. I cannot wait till you harass all the people with your <laughs> questions down there. And I want a full debrief because I love it when people do that sort of thing. Uh, the expo is back too. This last week, the announcement came out from the PCA that our expo in Orlando is happening. I think it's February, March uh, of, of 2022. That is going to be great because it's been a long time. It would have been two years since we had uh, our last big gathering like that. I would urge you guys, yes, it's a commitment. You're going to have to fly. You're going to have to drive. You're going to have to get a hotel. You're going to have to pay for the registration. I can guarantee you one thing. I have never met a human who walked away from residential forum, craftsmanship forum, commercial forum, PCA expo that said that was a complete waste of time. I got nothing. I have four notebooks of this and I'm adding to it today. All of this stuff has been guiding what I'm doing. You get gapped 10 times a day when you go to these events. And honestly, we can read the books. We can do the things. We can do the KPIs. Getting that perspective from other business owners in person is something you cannot get anywhere else. I can guarantee it is one of the most valuable things ever. So if you're interested in that stuff, look it up. Minnesota Masters class this Friday, uh, the 30th. Uh, I am on my home turf. 
Uh, Sherwin Williams is underwriting it, and I am more nervous than ever because these are not only my people, they are my people that I know and see their vans on the road. So it's going to be wild here this next Friday because uh, they're going to all have their calculators out. And when I present a slide, I bet you people are going to start calling me on stuff, which I love. So uh, look forward to that. And then, uh, yeah, that's about it for me. Um, thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Adam, for taking family time to do this. And everybody, have a good weekend.